Good morning, everyone. My name is Nicholas Reed from Reed Corporate, and on behalf of Minerals 260, ASX ticker MI6, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this special RRS Investor Webinar. Thanks very much for your time. Well, we last featured Minerals 260 just before the company listed on the ASX in October last year, following a $30 million IPO, which followed the spin out of the non-lithium exploration assets of the leading lithium developer, Linetown Resources. A lot has happened since then, with Minerals 260 hitting the ground running with a major drilling program at the company's flagship Moora project in WA's Julemar province, located some 95 kilometres north of Chalice Mining's world-class Julemar Discovery. Minerals 260's managing director, David Richards, had in fact pegged this ground several years before the Julemar Discovery, and with early drilling by Liontown before the demerger, revealing some exciting gold results, there has been considerable anticipation about what this first phase of drilling might reveal. Those results are now in and they've been released to the market in a series of important announcements by Minerals 260 in recent weeks. Without stealing David's thunder, I think it's fair to say that he and the Minerals 260 team are very excited about what they've found so far and even more excited about where the next phase of drilling could take the company. Before handing over to David to tell us more, I'd like to remind everyone who's listening in that you're most welcome to log any questions that you'd like to put to David. Please use the Q&A tab on your webinar browser and remember to put them in while David is speaking so that I have time to put them to him after he finishes presenting. I'll now hand over to David Richards, Managing Director of Minerals 260 to run us through where they're up to and what we can look forward to over the coming weeks and months. Welcome, David. Thanks, Nicholas, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Nicholas has indicated, today I'm going to be providing an update on the results of the exploration work uh, completed by Minerals 260 since the company listed in October last year. Uh, the emphasis will be on the Mora project, and the thing I want you to really take away from today's presentation is the significance of the results we've got so far and why we're so excited by them. Uh, the standard disclaimer, which I won't dwell on, but as always, this presentation is available on our website. Uh, and if you do want to study this page in more detail, then I suggest you go there later on. Uh, again, as indicated by Nicholas, uh, Minerals 260 was formed uh, to hold the non-lithium assets of Liontown Resources, which is now developing the, the world-class Catherine Valley Lithium Project. Uh, because of the Liontown connection, uh, the MI6 board is largely made up of... Uh, current and former members of the Liontown board, myself being the, the former member, I was previously the managing director of Liontown, but we have Anthony, uh, Tim Goiter, of course, and Craig Williams across from the Liontown board as well. And recently we've been joined by Emma Scottney, who brings additional skills, uh, business skills to the, Lion, uh, to the Minerals 260 board. So we have a board that can not only oversee the discovery of mineral deposits, it can oversee the development of mineral deposits. Obviously, the main assets for Minerals 260 are the Mora and Coogin projects. It's located, they're located in the, the Julemar Mineral Province of southwest Western Australia, about 150 kilometres north northeast of where we are at the moment. It's a large land position. We have a thousand square Ks. Before we picked up the ground and started working on it, it was largely unexplored. Uh, we've spent about $4 million uh, since listing in October last year. And importantly, we delivered on our IPO strategy with significant mineralisation intersected at a number of prospects. Uh, in, and one of the th key points of difference between us and a lot of other companies, I think, is our cash balance. We have about $25 million cash in the bank, which means that we can maintain the exploration momentum uh, at Mora and our other projects. And also, if the, a new opportunity comes along, it's the right opportunity, then, then we can act accordingly. Uh, it's been a busy time uh, since listing. We've intersected significant copper and or gold mineralisation at four prospects. Uh, the mineralised trends remain open at all of those and need following up. Uh, because we've been uh, in the Mora, uh, the same people have been operating in the Mora and Coogin area for a little while now. Uh, we've built, I think, pretty good relationships with the local farmers. Uh, they've come to realise that you know, we're professional about how we go about our, our work. So we're looking to actually uh, have a small winter drilling program and across some of the prospects which are located on the edges of the cropping areas. Uh, in addition to Mora and Coogin, we have a couple of other projects in the portfolio at Dingo Rocks, 
Uh, we've completed a couple of phases of uh, geophysical surveys down there. We've identified what we think are becoming drill targets. And at Yell West and the Northwest Yilgarn, uh, the tenement's now been granted there. We've completed the initial reconnaissance and we're preparing to do some first pass geochemical sampling. So moving on to Mora and Kujan, as I said before, it's a large land position. Importantly, it's a contiguous land position. The, the, the tenement blocks is one tenement block. It's not piecemeal tenements here, there and everywhere. It means we can actually do seamless exploration across the project area. Uh, we'll, along with Chalice and Caspin, we're one of the early movers in the region. And, and what I mean by that is our initial land position was picked up before Julemar was discovered. Because we were there early, we picked up what we thought was some of the better ground. Uh, and this has been reflected in our drill results. We've had a good success rate. You know, we've got three main prospects. We've had three out of three when it comes to follow-up drilling. So the high hit rate, uh, the limit of exploration work that's been done in the region to date really does highlight the potential for a significant discovery in the area. It really hasn't been that hard uh, to get some good results there. And beyond the prospects that we've drilled already, we have a number of high order targets, which we're looking forward to getting in and doing the initial drilling on as well. Uh, we've identified three pers prospective trends on our land position. In the west, we have the northern extension of the Julemar trend where uh, we, we've already identified a number of targets. Further to the east and a parallel trend, the Mount Yule Corridor, this is the area where we've done most of our work. It's where the uh, discovery zones of Mint, Zest and Angipina are located. In addition to these, uh, recent gravity work has identified a very large gravity feature. It's 10 by 3 kilometres long, which we refer to, refer to as the Mora Gravity Anomaly. We uh, think this is probably going to be an important control on localising mineralisation. So this is a pretty, pretty exciting development. Within both the Julemar Trend and Mount Yule Corridor, uh, we're waiting for thousands upon thousands of geochemical assays. We've done a lot more infill and first pass geochemical sampling. We've also done additional air core drilling. So have a lot of assays pending, which we're hopeful will lead to the definition of more drill targets. Further to the east, we have the historic Bindi Bindi Nickel Trend. Uh, this is an area back in 1968 where Poseidon of all companies uh, intersected some very uh, shallow but significant nickel results, which have never been followed up with deeper drilling. Uh, I mentioned the Mount Yule Corridor. Its name comes from what we refer to as the Mount Yule Magnetic Anomaly. Uh, this is a large magnetic high. It's seven kilometres long east-west, two and a half kilometres north-south. Uh, drilling across the Mount Yule Magnetic Anomaly has intersected significant mineralisation at three prospects. So at Mint and Zest, we've got very good, very significant copper gold mineralisation at both of those prospects. The mineralisation soils appear similar. And at Angipina, we've defined a gold zone at over more than 900 metres of strike. All zones remain open along strike and at depth. And uh, we believe large parts of the Mount Yule Magnetic Anomaly remain to be adequately explored. So a very prospective target. Just zooming in on the prospects themselves, uh, the Mint Copper Gold prospect. This was first picked up at the end of 2020 when shallow air core drilling intersected nine metres of 2% copper in the bottom of the hole. Uh, we did drill underneath this uh, hit pretty quickly. Unfortunately, we went straight into a barren dolerite dike, but we did some downhole geophysics uh, that identified an off-hole conductor, uh, which we came back and drilled the, earlier this year and it intersected, you can see there, a nice robust 24 metres of 0.7 gold and 1.9% copper, including a, a higher grade zone of up to 14 metres, almost 3% copper. The mineralisation of mint is associated with a large geochemical anomaly, a one and a half kilometre copper and soil anomaly, a one, point, a one kilometre long IP conductor, uh, which is only at this stage, the definition of that's only restricted by the amount of IP we've done there, so it remains open. And an accurate magnetic high, which we're not quite sure what it is, but we think it's important. Uh, all these factors combined indicate to us that we're dealing with potentially a large system and obviously we're looking forward to getting back in there and drilling this as soon as we can. Zest, similar style of mineralisation to mint. Uh, in contrast to mint, this was a geological discovery. Uh, there is no coincident geochemical anomaly. We suspect it's probably because the sample spacing is a bit too wide. Uh, it was picked up by a line of shallow air core drilling along an existing track. Uh, one of these holes, hole 72 there, intersected anomalous, but not all grade, I should point out, anomalous gold and copper gold uh, in a drill hole. Stood out significantly from the rest of the holes. We came in this uh, again earlier this year, drilled a hole underneath it and intersected 12 metres of two grams gold and 1.4% copper, including that nice high grade zone there I've shown on the section. The true width of this mineralised zone is yet to be determined. Unfortunately, uh, the pegmatite, a barren pegmatite dike, I should point out, has come in and has true to the system and has actually stoked out mineralisation. So 
The mineralized zone may actually be significantly wider. So moving on to Antipena, this was our original, the first prospect we defined. Uh, it featured in our prospectus. Uh, since listing, we've got back in, we've done additional drilling. Uh, we defined a gold zone over more, more than 900 metres of strike. Again, it remains open. Um, we need to do more drilling here to get a better handle on the controls of mineralisation. So we're planning to do additional holes just to understand the trend and the orientation of mineralisation after which we'll then do further follow-up. So just moving on to the regional picture of Mora. Uh, when we first started exploring at Mora, we focused very much on the magnetic anomalies. We did this because magnetic anomalies is one tool you can use to identify prospective mafic, ultramafic intrusions. And the only problem with that is there's not all mafic, ultramafic rocks are magnetic. So there's a potential that you could actually miss a lot of prospective rocks. So we come in earlier this year, we've completed a gravity survey over a very large area. And this gravity survey has defined a very large, a 10 kilometre long, three kilometre long, three kilometre wide, sorry, magnetic high, uh, gravity high, which we think is caused by a very large mafic, ultramafic intrusion. And you can see here that the northern part of the gravity high is actually coincident with the Mount Yule magnetic feature. So it's sort of confirming that at least part of it is caused by mafic, ultramafic rocks. Importantly, the mineralisation that we've intersected to date appears to be focused on the margins of the magnetic uh, gravity high. And we think this margin zone is an uh, important control on mineralisation. And we've worked out, we probably have about 25 kilometres of this marginal zone around the gravity high. We've since done more detailed gravity, which will allow us to model the anomaly in detail and allow us to do drill testing, specific drill testing into the, into the contact of the, of the gravity high. So that's more, all those, all everything I've talked about so far is on our wholly owned ground. Uh, the Coogin JV is immediately to the west of the Mora project. You can see it's contiguous with the western boundary. Uh, it was acquired back in 2021, so 12 to 18 months after we started work at Mora. This means we're 12 to 18 months behind where we are at Mora when it comes to exploration work. We've focused largely this year on target definition work, so we've done multiple geophysical uh, programs. Uh, we've done additional uh, first pass and infill geochemical sampling. And we've also done a little bit of air re reconnaissance air core drilling. So we've got a lot of data to come, which we're confident will identify more drill targets. But early last year, we did do some work here on the Coogin ground. We identified a number of targets, which we've followed up as well this year. And two of those targets, Bulbana and Maori, look very interesting. So Bulbana in the southwest part of the Coogin JV, uh, we've identified a robust gold anomaly. It's five or 600 metres long, 50 to 100 PVV gold, nicely coincident with an IP anomaly. You can see there the red outlines the soil anomaly, the hot pink colour is the IP anomaly. So it should be, could be suggesting we have some sort of sulphide system below the gold, gold anomaly. Similarity, Mallory, uh, this is a multi-element anomaly. It's plus two kilometres long. It's got coincident copper, gold and platinum group element anomalies in coincident with a large IP anomaly again. So two walk-up drill targets, which we're looking to get in and drill as soon as we can. So the next steps are Mora. Uh, we've obviously got the, the main prospects. We've, we've already intersected mineralisation. We're keen to get in and follow those up and they look very exciting. Uh, we have at least 10 other targets which are drill ready, including Mallory, Bobana, and, and hopefully the margins of the uh, Mora gravity anomaly. And beyond that, we've done a huge amount of target definition work. So we've got over 5,000 samples in the lab for which we're waiting for assays to come back. And we expect these to uh, hopefully, or we expect these to find more drill targets and that will then hopefully lead to more discoveries. So that's Mora and Coogin. Uh, just quickly on the other, other two projects, uh, Dingo Rocks, it's in southeast Western Australia. It's about 100 kilometres uh, south of Norsbyn. Uh, it's located on the margin of the Albany Fraser province close to the Yilgarn Craton. So sort of broadly a general, similar ge geological setting to, to Nova and Tropicana, which are located to the northeast. Uh, we picked the Artenum up because it was a series of magnetic highs, which had never been uh, adequately explored. Uh, we think these things have had potential to be mafic, ultramafic intrusions, prospective for nickel, copper, PGE mineralization. I suppose broadly analogous to what you see Galileo intersecting up near Northern recently. The area is largely covered by transported material and previous exploration has been ineffective. Interestingly, since we've acquired this tenement and since the float, Amica Gold, who have the tenement immediately to the west, have been intersecting some or reporting some pretty significant gold results. Uh, you know, 23 metres of five grams per tonne gold is, is pretty significant in anyone's terms. So that's pointing to the metal fertility in the region 
and you know it's the same sort of geology we have on dingo rock so that's promising uh, from a uh, exploration point of view since uh, we floated at ding uh, uh, we've done two phases of geophysical uh, work at dingo rocks we've done a gravity survey similar to what we've done at mora uh, this has identified a number of uh, relatively dense bodies consistent with being mafic ultramafic intrusions uh, we plan to get in the, here and follow these up with ground em and probably reconnaissance drilling Additionally to that, uh, the regional magnetic data identified a number of pipe-like features. We have no idea what these are like, what these are caused by, but we've got in and have done some detailed magnetics over a small area there, and we've confirmed the presence of, uh, that we've confirmed that these things are real. Uh, so we have both magnetic and gravity targets to follow up, and uh, we look forward to doing some of these later this year. Yale West, uh, as I mentioned, is in the northwestern part of the Yilgarn Craton. This is an area that's never been explored previously. Um, we picked it up because there's magnetic features there that have never been explained again, which we think are remnant greenstones. Uh, this area uh, is, has basically been mapped as unprospective or non-prospective granitoids, so that's the reason it hasn't been explored. But the mag magnetic data and, and additionally the gravity data would suggest that we're dealing with more than just uh, uh, barren granitoids up here. So we've done a short reconnaissance trip. We've confirmed we do have other rock types in this area. And now we're preparing to do a first pass geochemical program over the project just to see whether there's any anomalous metals in the area. So that's basically it. Um, so just to sum it up, why Minerals 260? Well, I've said it before and people are probably sick of me saying it, but we were smart enough to be one of the early movers in the Julemar Mineral Province. Uh, Follow-up work has uh, reported some very good results from at least three prospects. Uh, beyond those, we have a strong target pipeline that we're ready to drill. We have the access agreements in place that we need to actually get on the ground. The area is still largely unexplored. Uh, we've been exploring here for at the most two to three years. When you compare this with the eastern gold fields of Western Australia, where there's been exploration since the 1960s, you can see the potential upside, not only on our ground, but in the region itself. We have a board and management team that know how to find them and importantly know how to mine them. So that's critical as well. And our, our cash position of 25, around $25 million means that we're well positioned not only to advance our existing projects, but also to acquire new opportunities uh, if they so arise. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thanks very much, David. Um, we'll run through a few questions. Uh, just sure. a reminder to everyone listening in, just firing your questions and I'll get them uh, on my phone here. So um, shoot them in. But uh, just to kick off with a couple, David, we, uh, you've effectively got all grade intercepts over a number of, of areas yep. at, uh, at at the project. What's your strategy going to be with the next round of drilling? Will you be sort of aiming to look for resource potential in those areas or are you still looking at the, the bigger picture, if you like? Uh, no, uh, we'll follow those up. So the next phase of work will just be to step out uh, long strike and down dip to see whether we do have a coherent, continuous zone of mineralisation and, and try to scope out the potential size of it, you know, how long, how thick is it? And then once we've got a handle on that, we you know, let, you know we word a resource drilling as soon as we can. We're um, and uh, we've got the capacity to do both. So while we're advancing those prospects, we'll be also looking at the bigger picture as well. It just in terms of the style of mineralisation that you found. You know, we think Julemar, we think Chalice, nickel, mm. copper, PGEs. We've obviously seen gold and copper gold yeah. today. Do you have an idea about what what we're dealing with? What sort of Beast we're dealing uh, with here. Yeah, this is probably my least favourite question I get asked, <laughs> Nicholas. Um, listen, I, I we don't know. Um, it's a bottom, you know, bottom line. Um, I suspect we're looking at some sort of modified, structurally controlled Archean systems that have been, you know, been deformed and metamorphosed. But bottom lines, we don't really know. Um, you know, the risk of being blasphemous to all the intellectual geologists out there. I don't really care. Um, I'll go where the mineralisation is, and if it's big enough and high grade enough to mine, I'll, I'll worry about what model it fits into later on. Yep, yep. And in terms of the uh, um, the timing of the program, David, can you give us a bit of a colour around? Uh, we're we're hoping to get a better feel for uh, the timing of, of, of uh, and how much drilling we're going to do over the uh, the winter period. We've certainly got okay from one farmer to get up there and do some drilling. We're, we're hoping to get the okay from another farmer to get up there. Again, when I talk about a winter drilling program, I'm not talking about drilling in the middle of crops in paddocks. I'm talking about drilling on the edges of existing cropping areas and doing it in such a way we don't impact on their 
on their pack, their activities. Uh, listen, we hope within the next week or so we'll be in a position to actually put some detail around the amount of drilling we're going to do and, and where we're going to drill. But, Fantastic. And you know, we are confident that, that you know, we are getting phone calls from drilling companies now, so it looks like things are loosening up a bit when it comes to access to drill rigs. So you know, we're, we're confident that we can get some, get some drilling done well before the end, of, you know, the crops come off in November and December, and then beyond that, we still have a heap of work to do as well. And in terms of news flow, there's still assays from Aircore. Yeah, I mean, it's assays from Aircore, you know, and and the geochemical sampling. They're, they're really more geochemical techniques. I, you know, we could get lucky like we did at that Mitten Jag and intersection. You know, the Aircore drilling is very wide spaced. It's shallow. It's probably testing 10, 20 percent of the stratigraphy at most. So really, it's just about intersecting the the margins of a mineralised system. But you never know, like like meant, we went straight into the mineralized system, so we may get that as well. So yeah, we're still waiting for those assays to come in. And the next question everyone asks is how long does that take? Well, it takes two to three months, unfortunately. So um, it's, we're expecting to see you know, results starting to flow next month, hopefully. Yeah. I did get a question earlier from an investor. If you could just talk a bit more about the Cooge and JV and where that's up to and if that is that a different style? Of no, um, or is it essentially a, no, more more of the same. It's probably more of the same. It's just structurally modified, uh, you know, similar styles of mineralisation. But again, early days. Um, we've done no deep drilling on the Coogan drought, um, so you know we're looking forward to getting in and, and drilling some holes. And so we don't actually have in Coogan, we don't actually have any intersections in the fresh bedrock. It's either weathered, it's all everything's weathered, or it's just a geochemical sample. So again, it's it's early days. We are seeing extensive anomalism there. Um, and we've got some, you know, it's coincident with some pretty robust geophysical anomalies. So, you know, I think we're, we're, we're confident or positive that we, we get onto something there. And we're, we're looking at doing that later this year. Fantastic. Yeah. And just finally, Dingo Rocks, um, timing on that? On that uh, I'm actually sitting down with the uh, Native Title. We've got an access agreement with the uh, Native Title Group already executed. I'm just sitting down with them tomorrow to actually talk about organising a heritage server. So we hope to get that done, you know, in a fairly timely manner. And, and then it's a matter of going through the typical government permitting and, and then onwards with the drilling program. So hopefully third quarter this year, uh, to, you know, by the time we, it's just reality, by the time we work our way through the systems, the bureaucracy, but that's that's what we're looking at. Uh, third quarter this year. Yeah. Yeah. And just a final one to wrap up, David. So you've got a strong balance sheet you yeah. raised, and I think that was the whole idea of Absolutely, doing a yeah, sizable yeah. raising yeah. and obviously yeah. market conditions a bit different now. Yep. Yeah. Um, how long do you see that lasting? Uh, well, it's going to last us a good two years at least. Um, we can advance, we can slow down depending on results. So if we do get onto something red hot, then we can push the button and go harder. Uh, you know, we'll probably have $15 million in 12 months' time in the bank if we just keep going steady, steady. So it's it's going to keep us going for, for quite a while. But it gives us the flexibility uh, to really do what we like going forward and not be relying on going back to the market. And you're right, that was the whole purpose of, of raising $30 million at the time. We could see the market, the appetite was there, and we, we just didn't want to have to be in a position where we had to go back to the market in 12 months' time to raise more money to, to advance things like Mint and Zest and Antipena. So, And given what the market's done, I'm glad we did it. Absolutely. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thanks very much, David. I Thank think you, that, Nicholas. That covers it. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, everybody.